Direction. I'll get it. Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to this morning's Good Friday service. We thank you for making time in your day for this holy remembrance. As we begin our service this morning, we'll be singing two songs together, and we'll ask you to remain seated for those, as we would for a funeral. And then there'll be a, a series of readings by members of our leadership team followed by singing and uh, participating in Holy Communion. At this time, I'd like to open our service in prayer. Will you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, as your people, we gather together this morning in an act of remembrance. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus made for us and together today we contemplate the meaning and the power and the hope that's found in, in what happened so long ago and what continues to happen in our hearts as we follow Jesus. This morning, we invite you to meet with us, inhabit our worship, in the words of our songs, in the contemplation of our heart, in the act of participating in communion. Be present, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join us in singing?
In Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, we read these words. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations And kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, 
Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. These words were written approximately 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. This morning we would like to tell you the story of Jesus' arrest and trial and crucifixion. I want you to see if you can recognize the fulfillment of the prophecy that we've just read in the story that we're about to tell you. In order to do that, I'm going to ask some friends to join me. These are members of our church leadership team, and if you'll come now. And for each um, portion that is read, each part of the story, each scene, there will be a slide that accompanies it. The first one is on the screen now. We'll ask Dave to come and read that portion of the story. Once upon a moonlit night, amidst the whispers of olive trees in a garden called Gethsemane, Jesus and his disciples gathered. The air was heavy with anticipation, for Jesus knew what lay ahead. As they prayed, a hushed rustle swept through the trees, and the flicker of torches pierced the darkness. The betrayer, Judas, led a band of soldiers and officials armed with swords and clubs, their mission was clear, to seize the light of the world. Jesus, with love in his eyes and courage in his heart, stepped forward. Who are you looking for? He asked, his voice steady in the voice of betrayal. Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus declared, his words capturing the weight of truth and power. At his words, the soldiers staggered backward, as if struck by an unseen force. But Peter, loyal yet impulsive, drew his sword and struck out in defense of his beloved master. Jesus, with a gentle touch, healed the wounded soldier and spoke to Peter. Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And in that moment, Jesus showed what true strength looks like, not in swords or in violence, but in surrender to the will of God. He willingly submitted to the journey that would lead him to the cross where he would conquer sin and death once and for all. And so, in the garden that night, Jesus stood tall, defiant against the force of, the, of darkness, filled with a love that would never falter. And though the shadows of betrayal loomed large, the light of the world shone brighter still, illuminating the path of salvation for all who would follow him. In the flickering glow of the courtyard, a scene unfolded, a tale of human frailty and divine forgiveness. Peter, once bold and brash, now lingered in the shadows, his heart heavy with fear, 
Three times the question came, piercing through the night like a dagger. Aren't you the one of Jesus' disciples? The first denial slipped from Peter's lips, a whispered falsehood born of doubt and desperation. I am not, he declared, the voice barely above a murmur. Yet the limelight betrayed him, casting shadows that danced with accusation. Another question, another denial, each word a painful echo of his own weakness. And then, as the rooster crowed and the night pressed in the weight of his betrayal, settled upon him like a cloak of shame. For in the third denial, Peter's voice cracked with anguish, his denials ringing hollow in the face of truth. But even in the depth of despair, grace awaited. For Jesus had spoken the words of forgiveness before the first denial had ever passed Peter's lips. And through the rooster's crow, mankind moment his failure, which also heralded the dawn of redemption. In the courtyard that night, amidst the flicker of flames and the hushed whispers of onlookers, Peter's story was not yet finished. For his journey would lead him from denial to restoration from brokenness to healing, guided by the hand of the one who knew the heart better than he knew himself. And so, in the midst of his own moments of doubt and fear, we may remember Peter's tale, not as a story of failure, but as a testament to the boundless mercy of the one who never gave up on us, even when we fall, up, fall us or fall. In the solemn halls of power, a trial unfolded, a clash between earthly authority and divine sovereignty. Jesus stood before the high priest, his eyes steady, his demeanor unwavering. False witnesses emerged, their accusations like arrows aimed at the heart of truth. Yet Jesus remained silent, his silence a testament to his unshakable confidence in the Father's plan. For he knew the truth and judgment lay not in the hands of mortal men, but in the wisdom of God. The high priest, sensing the weight of the moment, pressed Jesus with a question. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? With calm resolve, Jesus spoke, his words resonating with power and authority. I am, he declared, his voice echoing through the halls of eternity. In that moment, the truth ran out like a clarion call, piercing through the darkness of doubt and deception. For Jesus was not merely a man, but the very Son of God, sent to redeem a world lost in sin. But the high priest, blinded by pride and prejudice, recoiled in the truth. In the fury, he condemned Jesus, rejecting the light in favor of the darkness. Yet even as the shadows of injustice closed in and the truth remained unshaken, for Jesus had come not to condemn the world, but to save it, to offer forgiveness and grace to all that would believe. And so in the midst of trials and tribulations, may we cling to the truth, the truth that sets us free, the truth that guides us through the darkness of nights, the truth that shines brightly in the face of adversity. For in the trial of truth, we find not condemnation, but redemption. In the grandeur of the governor's palace, a trial of kings commenced, a clash between earthly power and heavenly purpose. Pilate, the governor, questioned Jesus, seeking to understand the charges brought against him. The religious leaders stood by, their hearts filled with envy and malice, their accusations veiled in deceit. Yet Jesus stood before Pilate, a picture of serene strength, amidst the tumultuous storm. 
the governor sensing something extraordinary in his humble carpenter and Na uh, from Nazareth probed further, are you the king of the Jews? With quiet dignity, Jesus replied, his words resonating with the authority of a monarch born not of this world. You say rightly that I am a king, he affirmed, his gaze unwavingly. In that moment, the truth hung heavy, heavy in the air, confronting the governor with a choice, a choice between worldly power and divine sovereignty. But Pilate, torn between duty and desire, sought a way to appease the crowd. He questioned Jesus further, yet found no fault in him. The accusations hurled by the religious leaders crumbled in the face of truth. Yet the clamor of the crowd grew louder, their demands for justice drowning out the voice of reason. And so, succumbing to the pressure of public opinion, Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified, a verdict born not of justice, but of expediency. For even in the midst of betrayal and injustice, the true king remained undeterred. For his kingdom was not of this world, but a kingdom of love and grace, where the broken are made whole and the lost found their way home. And so, as we ponder the verdict of kings, may we remember the true king who willingly laid down his life for us, a sacrifice born not of earthly power, but of divine love. And in, this, and in his kingdom, may we find forgiveness, redemption, and everlasting hope. On a hill called Golgotha, the journey of redemption reached its climax, a convergence of suffering and salvation, despair and hope. Jesus, burdened by the weight of humanity's sins, carried his cross in the place of the skull. Each step was a testament to his love, a love so vast it stretched from eternity past to eternity future. At the foot of the cross, soldiers cast lots for his garments, callously unaware of the magnitude of the moment. Yet amidst their mockery and indifference, Jesus uttered words of forgiveness, his compassion encompassing even those who nailed him to the tree. Above his head, a sign proclaimed his kingship, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The ir irony was lost on many, but the truth rang out across the ages. Here, in the shadow of the cross, a king unlike any other reigned supreme. As darkness descended upon the land, creation itself seemed to mourn the suffering of the creator. Yet even in the depths of despair, hope flickered like a tiny flame in the darkness. And then, with a cry that echoed through the heavens, Jesus breathed his last. A final act of love, a triumphant declaration of victory over sin and death. But the story did not end here. For in that moment, the temple curtain was torn in two, symbolizing the barrier between God and humanity forever shattered. And from the side of Jesus flowed water and blood, a symbol of purification and atonement, of new life born from death. As the soldiers pierced his side, fulfilling ancient prophecy, a witness stood by, a disciple whom Jesus loved. And in his testimony, we find the assurance that this was no mere mortal, but the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so, at the crossroad of redemption, may we kneel in awe and gratitude, humbled by the magnitude of the sacrifice made on our behalf. For in the death of Jesus, we find life everlasting, and in his resurrection, we find hope that will never fade away. A 
as the sun dipped low on the horizon, signaling the end of a day filled with darkness and despair. A group of faithful followers gathered to perform one final act of love and devotion. Among them was Joseph of Arimathea, a man of wealth and influence who had secretly followed Jesus. With courage born out of conviction, he approached Pilate and requested the body of Jesus, determined to give him a proper burial. With Pilate's permission granted, Joseph and Nicodemus, another disciple, took down the lifeless body from the cross. Their hands, once accustomed to scrolls and coins, now tenderly cradled the broken form of their beloved teacher. Together they wrapped Jesus' body in linen cloths, anointing him with spices, a gesture of honor and respect befitting a king. And as they laid him in a tomb hewn from rock, their hearts heavy with grief, they sealed the entrance with a large stone. And so, as that long night descended upon the earth, a quiet reverence enveloped the garden tomb, a sacred space where the Savior of the world lay at rest, awaiting the dawn of resurrection. That's the end of our story today. If you want to know how the story ends, you have to come back Sunday morning. That will be the rest of the story. Right now, however, we want to invite you, and ushers, if you could just bring the lights back up a bit, please. We want to invite you into a time of remembrance as we participate in Holy Communion. I'm going to invite the deacons to join me at the table. At Harmony, we practice open communion, which means that as long as you uh, have placed your faith in Jesus and recognize his sacrifice for you, you are welcome to participate with us. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And as he did so, he said to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Take this and eat it. And when you do, remember me. Remember this sacrifice that I'm about to make. And then after they had eaten, he, he took a cup of wine and he said before them, this, this is the blood of a new covenant. By, by my blood, you have forgiveness of your sins. And so when we drink this from this cup and as we eat this bread, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on that first Good Friday. As you do so this morning, as we participate together, we're going to pass first the bread. And for those that require a gluten-free option, there are some in the center of the plate. Take that and just hold it. And then we will pass the cup. And we invite you to take that and hold that. And then when all have received we will um, eat together. At this time, I invite the musicians to play as we pass the bread.
Let's pray together. For what we receive by faith, we give you thanks, Heavenly Father, your own Son, given for us a sacrifice for the creation that he loved so much. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for hope eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive the body of Christ. Let's drink together from the cup of forgiveness. By his stripes, we are healed. None of us deserving. All of us equally receiving. That's amazing grace. Will you join us as we conclude our service with a song?
message of our service this morning is that mercy reigns. Perhaps you came here this morning or you clicked on this video link this morning and that's the message you need today. Mercy reigns. You are forgiven. You are accepted at the table of our Lord. As a people, we go from this place solemn because of the sacrifice made for us. But we return on Sunday expectant because this wasn't the end of the story. And it's Easter Sunday that changes everything. We invite you to join us then as we celebrate together our risen Savior. As we leave the service today, I just want to remind you of two things. One, that this evening at 7 o'clock, uh, the team of, of youth and young adults from our church that went to the Dominican Republic just a few weeks ago will be sharing their testimonies that, this evening with you. And they would love to invite you to come and, and hear what God did in their lives and through them as they were away. Many of you supported and helped them to go and they want to uh, just share with you how meaningful that experience was. So we invite you to come at 7 this evening. There'll be a time of fellowship together after that. And then on Sunday morning, uh, we have a full service for you. Um, as we celebrate together, there is no breakfast before service, as we've sometimes done, so just be aware of that. <coughs> However, there will be refreshments after the service. And as part of our service, uh, we'll be uh, participating in uh, the waters of baptism as we uh, have one individual who will be baptized on Sunday. It's going to be an exciting day. So we invite you to join us at that time. Right now, go as the people of God, as people knowing that this is not the end of the story. And reflect on that over these next couple of days. In Jesus' name, we return together on Sunday. Amen.